if you can't figure out if someone is engaged and actually doing their work, then, you know, you're, you're failing as a leader, in my opinion. Welcome to the Workplace Theater Podcast, where we explore the joy, the pain, the comedy, and human connections that make up the world of work culture. In this episode, our guest, Jeff Cole, explores the impact and the fine line between security, privacy, and the fear of surveillance in the workplace. Our hosts, Chris, Michelle, Joe, and Julius, share their insights while offering practical advice on navigating workplace culture. So sit back, grab your popcorn, and let's dive into the fascinating world of workplace theater. Welcome to the Workplace Theater Podcast, uh, where today's episode is the ethics of employee surveillance. Definitely want to welcome our guest, Jeff Cole. How's everybody doing today? Doing good. Great. Doing good. Great doing to be good. here. In spite of the traffic, cool. happy to be here. <laughs> Damn okay. it. Good, good. Okay. I'm feeling kind of like a, the energy. We're going to bump it up a little bit, right? So, okay, here we go. <laughs> so, uh, Jeff, again, welcome. Um Normally, the way we start these things is um, we start everything off with a headline. Sometimes it relates, sometimes it doesn't. And Michelle usually uh, takes this away. So, Michelle, like, what do you have for us today? Yep. Today's headline does have to do with our topic of ethics of employee surveillance. And I came across an article that was talking about sort of the next level, I would say, of using employee surveillance with perhaps some AI elements to it as well. And that was um, that Zoom has developed a technology that can be used, they haven't rolled it out, but can be used to help determine whether people who are on a Zoom call are paying attention. And the other piece that I, I was also reading about was a company that offered employees the, the chance to have a chip implanted that they could use to badge in and out of work. So these two examples really seemed to be very creepy and bordering on dystopian. And even, even if these aren't widely used now, the fact that they're out there, we just know it's going to be probably a thing unless something something big happens to, to stop it or regulate it. Um, but I just thought it might be a good topic to kick us off in this in this topic of uh, employee surveillance, even though it isn't quite as widespread. You know, just would love to get your thoughts. Well, I, I think, first of all, the first thing I think about is gaming the system. How do you game that system? You know, as an employee, you're always thinking like, oh, they're rolling this out. And the question is, are they letting you know? I'm, I'd imagine that they'd have to let you know if, well, maybe they don't have to let you know. Right. All of a sudden you're in a meeting. He's like, Chris, can I see you? <laughs> yeah. We noticed that you're really not engaged. And you're like, no, I've been completely engaged. Um, not really. Um, and then all of a sudden they, exactly. <laughs> a year later you get promoted and, and you're like, oh, that's what that meeting was about. That's how you knew it. You know? So, you know, I guess there's two sides that, that, that concern me. And when you roll something out like that, they never want to pull it back. They just want to go further. So that's my big, big concern. Yeah. I, I don't know. What do, you, what do you think, Jeff? You're you're in that world. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, I think it's it's really uh, you know it may, may have started from a, a a good place from an authentication standpoint, but just since Zoom had security questions and issues, and during the pandemic there were some Zoom bombings and situations that were happening where people were appearing in meetings that didn't they weren't invited to. Um, so from that standpoint, like that, that that's that's the side that's your kind of more security focused versus surveillance focused, where you're saying is someone actually paying attention? What you know are they are, is their face in the screen the entire time, which I think is completely overreaching and you know does, doesn't create a level of trust by any means uh, and, and like you said probably leads to people you know printing out a whole bunch of high definition photos themselves that they can switch out uh, just to replace their their real face anyway so that was my <laughs> idea <Yeah. laughs> Joe's about to patent that <laughs> Just yep. gonna have those little masks, you yeah. know, the, on the stick, on the popsicle stick, one with, yeah. one with each hat. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think Chris, it also. You, I was just gonna say, I think has anyone really done the science to determine how can you tell from someone's face whether they're paying attention? So, you know, are we going to leave that to Zoom or some of these for-profit companies to to figure that out right. and I, then apply it? I think if if. <laughs> 
if we have to look at all that to see if someone is engaged, that's a problem. Like, let's first of all, get them to turn their screen on, right? And see their face, right? And have them actually be on screen. But like, we always have meetings where we're talking at people versus giving people an opportunity to have conversation. And even a business meeting when you're coming and you're trying to say, hey, here's the work we got to get done, that can still be a collective conversation where it's not just one person talking and people have an opportunity to be engaged. So, Yeah, I think the, um, the other situation that I, m- reminds me of is just, you know, when I was at, when I was at one span, we were interviewing for um, like maybe like a Salesforce developer position <clears throat> and we were on the Zoom calls because it was during the pandemic. You know, that was the only way you could actually meet someone you could tell there was a delay between when you actually asked a question and when that you got the response back. So it was clear that someone was feeding someone in that those answers. And at, at a certain point, people were, you know, kind of just being pawns to get jobs that somebody else was actually going to be performing multiple jobs, f- you know, under the, this other person's name. Um, and so that's, you know, a real security concern about is, is someone actually is this person really working for us or oh, wow. you know, are they kind of behind the scenes? They have, have any sort of uh, someone else that's kind of really pulling the strings, you know? So there's, there's that that happens too. And, and I think because those situations come up, I think there's, there's kind of a knee jerk reaction at times to probably go a little bit too far. Yeah. Where, you know, the, like the average oh, person is really trying to do their best. They're not trying to, you know, play games. Um, so it doesn't really help when you're, you're putting everybody in a box and trying to, analyze every every little move they make mm-hmm. um, Jeff so. give your background a little just so the audience can kind of know you know what, what you've been doing a little bit yeah sure so I, I've been um, I mean I started off as an internal auditor in my career um, so people always viewed me as the police at that point mostly technology <laughs> focused so looking at just how different processes worked and the security around environments to make sure that you know th- um, nothing could go wrong I, one of the first things I ended up doing was I worked at Discover Discover Card, and so I had to write a program that basically recreated the cashback bonus to make sure that like the the real cashback bonus logic was working the way it should have. So uh, things like that, and then moved into financial systems, working with accounting teams, accounts payable, accounts receivable, um, you know, f- supporting those tools, and then more into data from there, um, setting up data environments, working with data, um, providing analytics. And then eventually uh, at one span in my current role at, at Workforce Software as a CIO. So just responsibility for all back office IT essentially, um, which you know spans from security through the operations, making sure the Wi-Fi works, people have machines that work, and then all the applications that people use on a daily basis, trying to make sure that those are as efficient as possible so that it's not, you know, a, a, um, an obstacle for them to get their work done. Mm-hmm. So. So we, well, yeah, so, we do have an expert here. In, in this yeah, thing. definitely. So, so bouncing back to this facial recognition, um, and I guess my question to you, uh, Jeff, like, I mean, for me, it kind of, it's like you're not addressing the real problem, right? There's a distinction between, um, you know, just tr- trying to get additional metrics as to how you can improve, you know, so to speak. There's one thing, right? But then there is, um, you're not really addressing the situation. Like, okay, you just gave the example about you know, the job or, I mean, or engagement. I mean, are you are you just like, again, are these like instant, like, like Band-Aids and Band-Aids and Band-Aids and easy to, you know, just try to, uh, you know, oh, yeah, we have this thing now, we can figure this out versus really getting to the root of what the real problem is. You know, are, are, is it really just extra metrics or are they addressing some of the problems, the real, the root problems? No, no I think in most cases, I would say it's probably, uh, it's kind of a crutch for poor leadership, I would say, where like that's what really should be trying to f- understand how people are performing. If you can't figure out if someone's engaged and actually doing their work, then you know, you're, you're failing as a leader, in my opinion. Uh, I mean, there, there are going to be productivity metrics. You know, people need to understand how they're measured with what they do. And in some roles, it's more quantitative than others. Um, but, you know, when you get to a point where you're, it's crossed that line into the surveillance world, you know, now you're, you're not really a leader, you know, because there's, you, you've, you've immediately cr- 
um, lost that trust that you need and the respect that you need kind of between um, a team to actually, you know, be successful. And you're likely also probably spending time, you know, surveilling people when you could actually be spending time getting something done and being, being productive. So, you know, you're just spinning your wheels. Yeah. yeah. I, I like the, the spin you had on that though, Julius, I think it comes from your entertainment background, you know, what are you doing to make the meeting engaging? What are you doing to make the job interesting? What are you as a leader doing to maybe take that information? Let's say the, the information's out there and they're gathering it, that it wouldn't be a comment on the employee, it'd be a comment on the, the meeting leader. It would be a comment on the person in charge mm -hmm. of engaging those employees, you know? And, and that's, yeah. that, that's kind of where I would think of the, the pros of this, right? Like, uh, Make no mistake, I, I hear this initially, I'm like, bad idea, but there are some possible good ideas, right? Or there are things that we can look at, right, with this technology. So if somebody's speaking, right, how engaged was that group of people with the message that you portrayed, right? So if you're in a sales, it's a sales environment and you got a bunch of people on the meeting and you want to know, did that land, did that not land, it, you know, you know, they may tell you it was great or they may tell you it was okay or whatever but you actually now have data where it says they were really engaged or it didn't matter because they you know their cameras were off or whatever the case might be um, so there are some applications where I could see this being very beneficial but exactly to what you just said Michelle's it's to the speaker right it's to the person leading the meeting to say did I do a good job mm -hmm. were people interested in what I had to say yeah. Right. And and it goes back to, you know, what we've talked about. And Chris, I 100 percent agree. Turn cameras on, but also have a meeting where we're engaging with people rather than talking at them. Right. Yeah. We're using Zoom as, you know, a replacement for WebEx, which, you know, you know, show up. Listen to a 45 minute presentation, put a question in the chat and there's an hour. Right. Um, I do think this does lead to a bigger discussion of how are you using meeting time in general? Mm -hmm. Right. I, and this has been a conversation for 20 years. Right. You can if if you're in meetings all day, how productive are you? Right. And then if now I'm in meetings all day, but I can multitask so I can actually get my work done while I'm listening into a meeting. But now here <laughs> the application says I'm not engaged in the meeting. Right. What's what's our ultimate goal here? Or do we want people engaged in the meeting? Do we want people to get work done? Do we want to have meetings be more meaningful? I think there's a way bigger question to ask. And, you know, this is not getting to the root of the problem. This is just kind of like, hey, technology can give you a metric. And then with a lot of technology, it's all about how you use the metric. Yeah. Well, I think that once something like this is out there, it's not going to be limited to just Zoom. And so I, I also noticed I was um, following up on this a little bit, and there was a letter, an open letter sent to Zoom by like 28 different human rights organizations saying, don't let this out, you know, don't roll this out. And appealing to regulators to say, you really got to be paying attention to this so that it doesn't get any further than where it is right now, because you could see some more sinister it's already potentially sinister even at a Zoom meeting, but um, being even more sinister if it got into different hands in different arenas. Right. You know? Yeah, I'm not, no, I totally agree. I mean, and hopefully, you know, the business community recognizes that this is not a, uh, a, a valuable thing to implement and it'll just die in the vine as a result because if there's no market for it, then, you know, they're not going to not going to put it out there, but it's just, it's just more as we kind of push toward, like you, like you mentioned, Michelle, like the dystopian society of people being surveilled everywhere. There's cameras everywhere. And yeah. People are recorded everywhere. And, um, you know, in some cases when there's crime that happens, great. You know, we were able to catch something on camera that we didn't, weren't able to previously catch. But, you know, in other cases, there's a whole lot of, th like, innocent things that happen that just, you're, you know, it'd be way better not to be constantly monitored and tracked. Absolutely. And I think it creates yeah. a, a whole different thought in people's minds yeah. these days around what's happening and, and, you know, how much space they actually have mm -hmm. to make mistakes, you know, mm -hmm. because 
depending on the situation, you know, you may be suddenly it's on, it's recorded somewhere and it's on video somewhere and it's there forever. Even now, now it's on, it's on the internet somewhere and it's, yes. it's there for the, your entire life. I can't even imagine that, um, you know, growing up, not having to worry about that, all the mistakes I made, you know, if they were captured on video and posted, you know, I wouldn't be sitting here right now. I'll tell you that. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, probably one of the, 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 the the points that <laughs> which you said earlier, Jeff, it's like if you're actually, uh, you know, spending time like just looking at people, you know what I'm saying? You could have been doing something else. Right. It just, you know, I don't know. I think where does this stuff end? It doesn't end. Right. And then all it takes is just like you said, Joe, oh, you know, there are a couple of you know good ways that you could use this or or if there was uh, some situation happened, some freaks out in a meeting. Oh, you know what? If we would have been able to see his, uh, you know, facial recognition, <laughs> possibly he wouldn't have exploded. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's just like you can find any reasons. Like, no, cut it off. That's it. Just next, you know, yeah. get that out of here. Period. <laughs> for, so for seven uh, minutes, somebody was stewing, and then they they couldn't take it anymore. Blew their top and went off but we're not going to look at those seven minutes leading up to it what somebody might have said or not reacted to them or anything like that you know it, it's one of those things if you bring compassion to it it could be could be a very interesting tool i i think we're all skeptical of it though um yeah yeah it's not the tool it's the people that's the problem <laughs> exactly. it's not the tool it's for every you know empathetic compassionate you know, what do you think about it? Like, just think about the workforce. What do you think about the people who are compassionate and empathetic? And that's all nice, and right? But work's got to get done, right? And who are those guys? Those are the guys that are, those, that's yeah, the that's, problem. that's who's going to use it because the ones that are compassionate and empathetic are, we're already, we already have our cameras on. We've already figured out different ways to engage this, this technology and this medium so that we can be connected. We can make sure that we're, you know, have the highest probability of engagement. Right. Yeah, I can't. And most topics, I try and think as much as I can about the the other side of the coin, the devil's advocate. Like in this case, I can't even get myself. I can't get my mind there. You know, <laughs> even maybe there's like you said, Joe, some some value in saying like, "Hey, was my content interesting enough? Can I tell from the reactions of the people in the crowd?" I mean, there's so many false flags with that that you're likely yeah. that you're never really going to get that answer. You know, yeah. I mean, it's somebody could be making some crazy faces at their cat or something. And you know, you think that they, right. they hate what you just said, but they, they really weren't even listening to what you just said. Right. So, you know, I think it's, I, I can't even, uh, I can't even find a, a, a world where this, that, that would be a good idea. Or, or so, your camera's facing, you know, one direction and the main screen you use is, is up somewhere else. So you're not even looking at your camera. So it can't even engage the technology or, or you're out somewhere in public and you're wearing a mask, you know, cause that might be a thing again. Right. Um, right. It, there's so many flaws. Yeah. yeah. Well, that rolls us right into our uh, the next segment, which is called the burning question. Is employee surveillance a necessary evil for improving productivity? And if so, can it be achieved without compromising employee privacy? Um, I would say I would say no. Uh, so I think there's there's clearly a difference between surveillance and productivity monitoring. Those two things are mutually exclusive in my mind. So I think you know it's if an employee feels like they're being surveilled, they're likely not contributing as much as they can contribute. They're likely not giving their best effort anyway, because again, you, you don't have that trust factor but with with the employee so i mean there's there's always things that you're going to monitor when you're uh, you know a role like a help desk position let's say where you know tickets come in and you need to see how many tickets are you handling on a um, weekly monthly basis whatever it might be part of that is to see not just are you working but understand how much uh, how much work there is right so if, if, if you reach a point where there's a you know the team is maxed out on how much they can actually manage. There's a good argument to be made there of adding some resources to the team, um, or maybe you know there's not enough work for for the team that's there. And you need to think about like what do you do? Can you re uh, reallocate people to something else? But you know once you reach the point of surveillance, and that's again kind of the line between security and surveillance. You know like where you can you want to get right up to that line as far as from a security perspective because there's things you definitely need to monitor more from a company standpoint where you need to make sure that 
data is secure, access to your environment is secure, you know, you're trying to protect everyone from the bad guys. Um, but when you, you know, reach a point where you're actually surveilling employees, you've, you've gone too far and you've broken, you've broken that trust and you're, you're not actually going to get the, the most from those employees. Well, let me ask you this. Would you consider um, a time card a measure of surveillance? Um, in some senses, yes. I think, uh, which ironically, that's partly what, what Workforce Software delivers, the company I work for, is you know tracking time, like punching in, punching out, a whole bunch of different ways to do that to understand um, you know, w when people are working. I think a lot of that also comes from um, compliance and regulatory issues that are set by you know, different agencies in different countries where you have to track time in a certain way and you have to report the pay in a certain way. So companies are essentially, you know, their, their hands are kind of tied to some degree where you, like, you just have to track it that way. That's just the way it, it goes. You, you have to make sure no one works, you know, more than they, they should. There's a, a break between the different shifts that you work, all those kind of things. So again, I think, I think where a lot of these things always start is like from a good place, you're trying to just make sure you're complying with these regulations. The regulations are there to make sure the employees are safe and they're not being overworked. And then all of a sudden you start creeping into a world where you're using it for some, you know, purposes that are, that's not really healthy for like the employee or the, or the, um, or the company itself. And that's where I think you start getting into the, you know, starts feeling like surveillance as opposed to just, Hey, we have to do this to make sure we comply with regular regulations. A step further. So shall just one more. What about yeah. quarterly reviews? I mean, I love quarterly reviews myself. Um, I think they're one of the most impactful ways to try and make sure that you're g like giving feedback to people on the team. I like to have the goals set on a quarterly basis so you don't have you know, the recency bias of an annual annual goal and someone really like kills it in the last quarter and you're like, hey, you had a great year. Like, well, may maybe not because the first and second quarter you were just kind of stumbling around doing nothing. But I forgot about it because it, that was six, seven, eight months ago. Where if you do it quarterly, you can actually kind of make sure people are, um, you know, getting feedback on the work that they just most recently did. And, and you can also make sure that the goals are set properly because things are, you, they're changing so frequently that if you set, you can't set goals for a year typically and expect those to be, you know, the goals that are actually most important by the, you know, the January 1st, are they still the most important goals as of December 31st? Probably not. There's probably some change that happened there. So I think quarterly reviews kind of give you the ability to be a little more flexible with that. And I think that's, it's helpful to have that level of feedback, um, in my opinion. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I was just say, Michelle, so you, you come from, uh, you know, the world of research where, you know, I mean, I, I, your, your, your hourly structure and um, how is, how does it, how, how does your mindset play into all of this? Well, I was thinking about the, the way that we managed our teams because my team that did research was doing research in the field. And so it was, remote before remote was cool. And so we had ways to track, if you will, to make sure that we had enough staff to do the work, like you were saying before as your example. Um, how many places, how many you know study sites does each person have to visit um, in a particular period of time to have, have what's considered a full schedule? How many people in our staff are, are visiting twice as many of, of what we consider the norm and how many are visiting half as many and why is that trying to understand those differences so there is a way to use the numbers to help launch you into a conversation I, I think that's the difference between um, you know some of the things that we've been talking about and using those numbers for, for management purposes I was curious to tease that out a little bit more, Jeff, the difference that you see between productivity tracking and surveillance. I think that's where, where Chris was going to, uh, but just to pull that thread a little bit more, like how, how do you see the difference? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, I'll use a different example as well around like professional services type organizations that are, you know, maybe they're, they're providing consulting or um, implementation services or whatever it might be. Um, you know, you, you need to track the hours they spend, partially because the, the client 
wants to make sure that they see how much is being spent and how you know where, where that's at. Um, but you also you need to make sure that the, those teams are profitable ultimately because the you know companies are there to make a profit. So if if you're not run, if you don't understand how many hours somebody actually is billable in the work that they're doing, you know then. You, you don't really even know what you know is, is your company profitable is that business segment even profitable with, with your company so i think you know the, but then you need to kind of compare that against are they actually delivering what they said they could deliver so if every project runs over you know even though they're billing properly then clearly something is not not actually working so you know in, in my opinion that's that's the more the productivity monitoring of okay let's try and figure out what happened like not necessarily assume the the employee or the person is the one who's screwing it up, but maybe the process is not mm -hmm. efficient. Maybe there's things that we can do to make it not take so long, you know, try and tighten up some of the time frames. Um, again, not to make people be so stressed out that they've, yeah. you know, they're working until they, uh, their you know, fingernails are bleeding, but, you know, trying to just um, help any way you can. And if you, and if you don't have that perspective, it, it's, it's hard. You, you have to kind of just thumb in the air, you know, does it feel like we're effective? I think so, you know, but maybe not like you don't really know until you kind of have some of that data. So, you know, I think, um, um, like again, that, that, that's where I think from a productivity standpoint there, it's the positive approach. When you start suddenly going across the line and you're, you know, um, attacking someone for some 30 minute period that you thought they could have been more productive or something like that. Mm -hmm. you know, now it's, you're just kind of, you've, you've lost like the forest for the trees sort of mm -hmm. situation at that point where I mm -hmm. think you're, you're so in the weeds that like, that's not, you know, if, if the overall objective was accomplished, who cares how that 30 minute time frame was spent? You know, they could have been getting coffee or yeah. what, whatever, you know, because um, they actually were able to get their, their work done in the, the other, other amount of time because, People are people can actually you know they work in different at different paces, different yes. speeds, a different experience. I mean, some someone can actually get something accomplished in a significantly shorter amount of time than someone else. So you know you have to kind of figure out like what what are the actual ex expectations of the job, and can someone actually get that done? Yeah, you know, and that's ultimately w where it kind of needs to end, so that it's not in a surveillance situation. So it sounds almost like it's not just like you were saying, Julius, it's not about the tool. It's about how it's used that you would kind of see the difference between the productivity and surveillance. Yep. Is yeah. that Comple accurate? Yeah, completely. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, so Jeff, I, what I hear you saying is there's a, there is a certain level of surveillance that is helpful and useful and productive. Um, but again, it's going to, it's really going to depend on the environment of the company, how things are used and the word you keep, using and the word one of the words we love is trust yeah right if if it comprom it sounds like you're saying if it's going to compromise trust it's not going to be productive exactly all right right i mean just even using a, like a non-business example um for like productivity you know chris and i play baseball together um if no one's keeping track of any sort of stats at some point all you have is what you can remember what someone may have done at the you know uh, at the plate how they were hitting you have no idea. I mean, but the team ultimately wants to win. The team wants to have the best people on the field at one time. If, 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 if the team recognizes there's one person who is dropping the ball and there's a weak link in that chain and nothing is being done to try and address that, you're bringing the whole rest of the, the team down. So if there's not an, an objective way, because you also don't want to make that feel like a personal you know, attack on that person. Like, hey, we don't like you. We're going to pull you off the field, whatever it might be. But if there's an objective way to say, like, look, you're just not producing. You know, we're trying to give you an opportunity. It's not happening. We're going to give someone else a chance here to step in. Like, then there's a level of respect and people feel like they're, you know, people actually, they want accountability, I've, I've found. And, and, and just know that everybody's like kind of above board. Everyone understands what, what's being measured and how the team knows that they're actually they're, they're being effective you know in, in in baseball it's wins like are you winning the games okay if you are great then it's it's working um but you know maybe not i guess that's not even necessarily the case either at, at times but um, well and then you kind of take that to 11 with like Moneyball. Right. right. So, so then, then it becomes a it becomes a business of we're in the business of winning for the cheapest amount of money. Right. <laughs> and so we treat people as these interchangeable pawns that we rotate in and yeah. out. So in a in a game, I'm assuming you guys haven't made minor leagues yet. Uh, that's sort of like for, for fun. <laughs> um, you know, it, it, it you even see it creeping in there. You know, like oh yeah. So it's, yeah, I mean, and Moneyball is a great example where you know the the data actually 
gave them a, a, a head, a step ahead of the, the rest of the teams, but it never actually, they never actually won, right? right. So yeah. they got pretty close. You know, they were able to actually leverage that data to get to that point. But in, in, in the end, there were, there were intangible things that they likely could not measure that had other teams be able to beat them to the, to the championship. So it, it wasn't, you know, it can get you pretty far, but it can't be the only thing that you you can use to but su succeed. Do you, do you feel like that was sort of more like a beta VHS thing where the other teams who had more resources took that same concept, even though they, pi you know, they piloted it and sort of became the VHS and it's now widespread and sort of amped up a bit. I mean, to some, to some degree, yes, but I also think like that's the, you know, in my opinion, as being a baseball lover, it's kind of like the mystery of that of the game is like yeah. the, you can't just look at, at the numbers. You, you can geek out all day about numbers if you want to. But <laughs> at some point, you know, just just putting the people with the right numbers in the right position doesn't really tell the whole story. Yeah. It, it can get you most of the way there in a lot mm -hmm. of cases. But there are other factors that, you know, are hard to kind of put your finger on that there needs to be some human element you know, some sort of strategy, chess work, whatever it is, you know, like the mindset of the t people the, on the team. The, the it's Ted Lasso factor. Exactly. Yes. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. For well, sure. Then, yeah. The you know, chemistry and yeah. Yeah. And, you know, other bonds and I, other things. Yeah. Yeah. I think though, um, you know, the problem is like, even if you, it's, you know, it's widely adapted though, like numbers, right. Um, in baseball, like every, you know, one of my friends is, that's what he does, right? And every team they want to know is, is get as much data as as possible. So bouncing it back to kind of the surveillance, and and I was thinking about as you were speaking, Michelle. Um, you know, my problem is they never want to roll this stuff back. So yes. then it starts there, and then the next thing you know, like okay, so you have your researchers out there, and so now they're pulling. Uh, uh, surveillance streams to see if they're, you know, like, oh, I have access to so and so. We have these uh, relate these partnerships with these different companies, surveillance companies, and so now you're pulling the feed from this area, this area, this area. And now you're dipping into these. Uh, yeah, so it's like you, you, no. You're reading my mind because what I was thinking about was that exact piece. So, with the example that I gave, you know, how frequently are you visiting the study site? It used to be up to the employee to determine, you know, this is a study site that has an inexperienced staff, they have a ton of patients, um, I, they have a lot of violations, I really need to handhold there a bit more and visit there more frequently. And I can explain that to my manager and they'll, they know the business, they are supportive of that approach. But now that this has been sort of you know, dataized a little bit more. I'm sure that's not the right term. They have taken the the um, onus away from the employee, and now there is an algorithm that spits out how frequently you may attend the the site visit. So, and you have you could potentially go you know get more frequent uh, visits approved, but you have to you know present your logic, and it's just not even worth it half the time. So. Just what you were saying, Julius, once you have it, have one of these tools out there and it seems like it could be useful. Hey, you know, it would be helpful for me to figure out my calendar for the 10 sites I have to juggle. Maybe this algorithm could be useful. But then when I want to make the human decision to go off script, then it breaks the system and, you know, people get really frustrated by that and demoralized. Yeah, I think I think in some cases that there, there has to be a caution around... Um, being too bought in on some of those things and not actually applying some logic, you know, kind of sort of common sense approach to how you're viewing some of it, where in the example you just gave, Michelle, like there, there could be some network effects, network things that have changed that are now different than actually the way the things had been previously been done. And if you can't adapt to that because a, a human can adapt to it immediately because they're in the situation, they can change how they're doing things, you know, then you're just kind of locking someone in saying like, no, no, you like, don't ignore everything around you. Right. Like just do this thing that yes. we said you need to do because we've already determined this is the most efficient way to do it. Yeah. And you know, we don't need you thinking because we've already, we've already thought for exactly. you. So thank, thanks for coming out. Um, <laughs> like that, like that doesn't, you know, that doesn't make you more incentive to look for those things to yes. be like, Hey, this uh, just so, you know, kind of raise the awareness. Maybe we need to change our approach. It also doesn't, um, you know, make people th that effective. If you realize that, 
what I'm doing is no longer relevant anymore, but mm -hmm. I'm just forced to do it because that's mm -hmm. how, you know, I've, that's so, the lane I've been forced into. Yeah. We can't, we can't change fast enough to adapt, right? We can't adapt differently. Like I, going back to baseball, right? Then yeah. the shift, right? It's, <laughs> I kind of, I'm like, if, Hey, shift, if you want to shift, because every left-handed batter should learn how to bunt down to third base. Like if it's going to be empty, that, that should be part of your training. Like, Chris, is Noah lefty? Is he? Okay. Um, Jacob's been hitting left-handed. He's actually better hitting left-handed than right-handed, even though he's right-handed. Um, and so I taught him how to bunt and, like, pulling it towards third base. Yeah. Like, just in case, you know. You never know. Right. I mean, the, the, the biggest concern in my mind is, like, you lose the learning aspect of, you know, if you get too tied up in the, in the numbers and the data, like, the learning is so important. Um, and, and, and that's the piece that, you know, there, there's machine learning, but the, the machine learning algorithms are based on data points that already exist because of how people have behaved. But now if you start directing people towards how they should behave based on how they previously behaved, n now you're not allowing them to change their behavior and things change all the time. And right. so you get in this vicious circle of, you know, not being able to really learn from like actual human uh, innovation right yeah, decisions yes. and like feelings and thoughts and things that yeah. you just are totally unable to replicate with uh technology yeah chip do you notice um kind of this perspective on how all this is rolling out and these different aspects of uh technology uh from like kind of a generational you know, aspect, right. And are you getting like, do you get pushback from younger folks or wide acceptance or, you know what I'm saying? Do you see any like generational, like uh, uh difference in, in how some of this, the new technologies are being rolled out? I'm not sure if it's specifically with technology, I would say there's, um, there's probably less concern over privacy in, in general, which, you know, is concerning because People don't quite understand what, you know, not, not having control of your own identity and, and, you know, trying to actually protect that information, how important that actually is, especially as we keep moving towards mm. a world where things are being more surveilled and there's more data out there around every single person that's out, out, out in, the, uh, uh, in the world. Um, and so that's an area, and I, and I would say, um, you know, especially in the U.S., like people just, they'll give away their information for a chance to win a Jeep or something. You know what I mean? Like no, nobody really cares. Like no one reads anything that's on the, you know, you're not walking around with your attorney being like, can you read these, uh, these the rules on this, you, you know? So like before I put my information on here, it says my social security number. I go, okay. Um, not recognizing like how, like where that can actually put you, which is in a pretty, you know, dangerous position. Um, so I mean, I really think that's an area where people need to be um, a little bit more, aware and a little bit more concerned is about their own privacy. And, and that's, again, where a lot of these things, and I think it's probably going to get there, especially as all this, this level of surveillance continues to kind of push, creep further and further, there's going to have to be a, a backlash. And, and so I do hope the younger generation has that, you know, mindset and philosophy. Um, I mean, I always appreciate when someone is concerned, you know, when, when um, if you want to use your own, your personal phone to access company, email or resources, whatever it might be, you know, there's, there's mobile device management applications that you actually put on those devices. And, and that's usually the, the point where someone says like, whoa, wait a minute, you know, are you going to be monitoring me? Like monitoring what I'm doing on my phone? Um, which is like, what are you doing on your phone? But, um, <laughs> uh, but that, but that's actually, I'm, I'm happy to ha have those conversations with people because it's, at least I know that there, there's some level of concern about their, you know, their own privacy. And, uh, there again is a challenge between security and surveillance where you're saying like, well, we need to have this on, the, on your device so that if your device gets stolen, no one can get into our corporate information. They can't actually access our resources. We have to protect that. That's the only way you're going to have access to that from your phone. On the other side, you know, th those applications can provide surveillance if you configure them that way. So people, you know, are, are right, rightfully concerned about how much information you can actually get. But if you trust the people that you're actually working with, you know, you're not as concerned that they're looking at every web page you're viewing, you know, whether you're at work or not, um, you're literally only going to use it for the purpose that you stated, which is, Hey, we want to be able to wipe your phone. If for some reason it gets lost or stolen. Um, so, you know, so I, I would say from that standpoint, 
I'm hopeful that the kind of the younger generation, I'm sure they will because every generation kind of has a different view of about um, everything really, especially technology. So mm-hmm. I'm hopeful that they will be, mm-hmm. you know, more concerned about their privacy going forward. Yeah. I, I feel well, that's like, great. I was just going to yeah, say go one, one last thing, and I'd love to get your take on this, Chris, too, since you work with you so much, but I, I sort of see the rise in uniz- unionization as sort of a youth driven movement in a way. And I, I see it as sort of an answer to the rise of surveillance, just a, a reclaiming of employee rights and me having a job that's serving me and me not just being the cog in the machine. I, I don't know if you're hearing that from the young people that you're working with, Chris. I think that's part of it. The other part of it is the pandemic and people you know, leaving their jobs and getting fired from their jobs and really I think trying to redefine like what they're going to stand for, what they're going to do in their life and what they're going to tolerate and not tolerate. Um, and the fact that people got to stay at home and be more efficient, I think allowed people's rights to open up a little bit more, especially, mm-hmm. you know, the younger generation because they didn't even get into the workforce yet. And they're like, I don't need to go to work to make money. <laughs> so um, I think it, it's, it's had a shift for yeah. sure. Thanks. I, I I do wonder how this might play into a more a, a shift in mindset of of work, right? So I've been I, I've been trying to use a term that's already taken, so I got to figure out a new term for it. But basically, so something that incentivizes productivity. So if we look at like Uber's model, right? If you're an Uber driver, you get you get paid per ride. But then there's also bonus structures, right? If you take so many rides, you get a, a bump in your pay. If you maintain a you know high four star rating, you get a bump in your pay, right? And then you get some other benefits and other things. You get to you know kind of pick your ride. You can you can pass on somebody if they're going in an area that you don't want to go. Like maybe you want to stay in a, a twenty mile radius from your home or something like that. Um, how might surveillance play into a, a different kind of environment where we are more focused on what you're actually doing rather than the hours and the, the, the time you spend on a task, but just the tasks themselves. Well, well that's where I think it, it, it's the difference between surveillance and productivity, where from a productivity perspective, you don't necessarily care in, in, in a lot of roles when someone does the work as long as they're able to actually produce when you need them to have, have that be produced. So if you're an Uber driver, you know, whether you drove from midnight to eight in the morning or, you know, seven in the morning to, to 3 p.m., whatever, whatever it is, is if there was an expectation around how, how much you needed to drive during, the, during the, that day, whatever it was, you know, and you met it, great. You know, there's no reason to say, um, you know, we're, we're going to actually surveil you and make sure that you're only going to be at the, here at this time. You know, I mean, that changes when you're, when you're in a role that's more of like a customer service type situation where you actually have to be somewhere at a specific time because that's when your customers are showing up. But if you're, you know, a knowledge worker and you're, you know, responsible for something, it's more about just getting those things done that you are responsible for than, you know, worrying about the time or, you know, how much time it took you to get there when you actually did that. Um, and that should be, you know, completely irrelevant. Yeah. So there's the, there might be a way then where, you know, maybe somebody does have more than one job. We've been, we kind of alluded to that earlier and I oh, yeah. can't remember if it was during our, our downtime or. I mean, it, it happens a lot now where I think there's, you know, people are, you know, two, three jobs. Someone can, you know, like I said, someone is, uh, some people are just more highly productive than others. You know, you can get an eight hour, what's expected of someone else in an eight hour day, you can get that done in three hours. Well, maybe grab another job or, you know, people have worked multiple jobs forever, right? So it's not like this, it's, that's a new thing necessarily. It's just people haven't necessarily worked multiple corporate jobs. You know, at the same, at the same, and the, at the same, and the same yeah, the same time period, right? right. But From nine to five, I have two different jobs. And, exactly, but you know, like Chris just said, now with, with the pandemic and the, and the realization that working remotely is, is fine as long as you're able to produce, you know, on one hand, I don't know what's the big deal if someone can actually get both of those jobs done, you know, more power to you. You can, you can do two jobs at once, you know, just like you can go whatever, drive a, you know, drive a bus during the day and then go work at a store at night. I mean, that's, those are two different jobs. No one ever has held that against anybody. So um, as long as it's, you know, as long as you're able to, to deliver what you're expected to deliver, it shouldn't really matter that much. Um, but corporate, com- 
corporate don't, doesn't think like that. They want to own you. Oh, and yeah. They don't want you going out and marketing anyone else's stuff. And they don't want you going out and being at other people's events because you're supposed to be there and you're supposed to be right. only for them. I mean, well, well, there's also the, the there's a security concern with that as well, right? Where you now have access to two different companies' environments. You make a mistake, somehow you can maybe cross the streams and yeah. you've now you know put some sensitive information from one company and another company. So like th like those concerns are real, but from a from a, just the thought of you know pe people working two different jobs, I mean. I, I, I don't know. I'm not sure if that's at some point that's going to be a, just a thing that's possible. If, if you really want to spend, you know, 10, 16 hours of your day, every day working. I mean, I guess, I guess why not? Right. Um, it's just when you, when you're doing that and you're lying about your identity or, you know, to try and make that happen is where, um, people are trying to weed those out at the very least, I guess. Yeah. yeah I want to end. I think I think Julie's trying to move us on to the yeah. next section. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so know, this is like an interesting topic. So, uh, Joe, why don't you? Our next section that we're going to get into is a, a situation. All right. So, imagine an employee is suspected of stealing from the company, and in order to gather evidence, the organization decides to review their personal emails, social media accounts, and whatever else they can look at. Right now, imagine you're brought in during this in investigation and you discover that the employee, a top executive's son, has been engaged with colleagues about potentially unethical practices within the company. How would you navigate the situation? So let me rephrase a little bit. You're, the situation's happening in the company. You may know, you may not know, right? Uh, then you're brought into it. And when you're brought into it, you find out it's like CEO's kid, right? right? How do you navigate that situation? I mean, if it was the CEO's kid, I, I would likely have to, you know, partner with the head of HR, likely uh, other executives to, to explain what was going on and, you know, make sure that there was, uh, well, I mean, first of all, be, you know, very, very sure that that, that was what was happening um, before then, you know, presenting it to the CEO so he, he or she knew what was going on. Um, it's, you know, you'd hope in those situations that there would be uh, accountability for something like that happening, depending on how severe it was. You know, the reality is, you know, we all know how some of those things get handled and things get kind of swept under the rug. Um, I mean, personally, if, if that sort of situation happened and it wasn't handled in a way that I felt was... Um, you know, above board and not trying to hide facts. Um, I'd, I'd likely probably leave that company, to be honest, if that if that was the case, you know, because it's just like I mentioned before with trust, like, you know, people want to work for leaders that they trust so they can do their best and they know that they're looking out for their best interest. I mean, I, I'm no different. So, you know, if my CEO, I, I feel like I can't trust and I, you know, think it's some questionable ethics, then... I need to go find someone else who I would rather work with. So, um, I mean, that would be how, how I, would, I would approach it personally. Michelle? Michelle. Yeah. I was like, <laughs> yeah. Thank you, being Jeff. in the, yeah. Uh, yeah, I know you're in the research and the pharmaceutical, but you know, it's a hot topic these days. I'm just uh, wondering like what's, what's going through your mind. Yeah. I mean, all the legal aspects immediately came to mind. So just what you're saying about partnering with HR, um, and, and what you said, I was thinking about, um, your reputation also is sort of tainted by however the ha company decides to handle that. Oh, completely. So, you know, your decision, you're in this hypothetical situation, um, your decision to move elsewhere, people know you and know that you kind of, the company you're at is a representation of you. So they, they'll know whenever they want, they are going to work for you, that you are representing someone highly ethical and has, there's like a level of trust there for your brand by by leaving that situation if it wasn't handled the way that would make sense to handle. Yeah, completely. I mean, it, and overall, you know, if a leadership team is not working in lockstep, people pick up on that really quick. And, yes. and they recognize when there's division and some backstabbing and some, some political things that may be happening. And it just leads to, you know, just general 
um, like distrust throughout the organization. I mean, it's no different than your parents, right? Like, so if you ask your parents something and like you recognize like one's going to say yes, one's going to say no, you know, you know how to play that game to figure out what you need to, you know, who you need to ask at what point, what time. But if there's a united front there, then you're just kind of like, well, this is the way it's going to be. There's not, not much I can do about it. And then, you know, I'm going to have to try and get in line here and, and, you know, keep moving forward. So, right. so I think that, that that's the piece where, you know, if that all of a sudden happens and now you, you've somehow fractured that, um, that leadership team working in lockstep. Yes. Now it, you've, you've, you know, you started cracking the foundation of, of what the company is actually, you know, should be based upon from a culture standpoint. It's so true. I mean, the, the, title of our pod is about the ethics of surveillance. So this is the ethics piece. You know, surveillance is coming up in all the situations, but it boils down to the ethics of using the information. How are you going to move forward? And right, how the company decides to handle that is hugely impactful. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It's funny, though, it, you know, we are talking about ethics, but, you know, one of the first things that was pointed out is like, well, it's CEO's son or, you know, top executive son. Right. So there's this extra, but ethics is ethics, right? Mm. Right. Yeah. <laughs> ethics should be, it should be, ethics should be ethics regardless of who it is. Um, so it's, you know, what, I guess the question is what ends up, you know, if it wasn't the, you know, CEO's son or whatnot, um, yeah, let me, you know, but it was, let me, let me play with that a little bit. So Jeff, Imagine you're back in your analyst days, right? Yep. So you're not you're no you're no longer with the lens of a CIO, but you're an, an analyst, and um, it's not the CEO's son. It might be like the the CFO's son. So it's not your it's not even your direct boss. It's you know one of their colleagues. Does that change the situation? Does that change the sensitivity? Does that change the way you look at it? I mean, it probably changes how quickly I could move on from a, a, the, the position, right? So, I mean, there's there's ethics where you can say like, hey, there's, here's my position, here's what I think I agree and disagree with. Um, there's also the real life situation of, okay, I need a paycheck, you know, I need, I need to be able to support my family and I may not be able to just walk out the door making some grand statement at, like immediately, right? Like, but, but I would assume in that case, I'd probably start looking elsewhere if I felt like there was, you know, the leadership in, the, in a particular organization were just not aligned with my own ethics. Um, and, and in, in some cases, maybe it's literally just a different department within the same organ, organization that that's possible too. Or I would say, you know, maybe it's time for me to move completely somewhere else where I feel, you know, a little bit more aligned with the ethics um, of the leadership. Yeah. But could you, could you be the person? So let's say that, let's say their ethics are in line with your ethics, right? Could you be the person that says, Yes, the, so the CFO's son was doing something nefarious, right? Here's the evidence. The company decides to terminate that employee or, or however that relationship is. Um, and maybe even the, the, the CFO moves on um, just because of the situation. Maybe it's embarrassing or whatever the case might be. Yeah. Would you be okay with, with staying at that organization? Do you think there would be any, anything else that you'd have to navigate inside of that? No, I mean, I think the way you laid that out, if that actually happened, I would be even more closely aligned, I think, with the organization to say, hey, look, they actually made the right decision here. They recognize what happened and, you know, they, they, they made the right decision. So um, it, it, it would almost, you know, bolster my confidence in working for that sort of a company mm -hmm. that that was how they would treat that situation and not try and, you know, put it, put someone in the corner and not try and hide it under cover somewhere, you know, be hopefully open and transparent about what happened so that, you know, it would prevent someone else from thinking about doing the same thing. Yeah. So you'd, you'd, you'd be okay with being the policeman again. Yeah. In the end, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't mind it necessarily. It's, uh, <laughs> you know, I try, I try, I try to be my, I think of myself more as a consultant than a policeman, but you know, sometimes <laughs> you cross the line there too, where you're a little more policey than you are consulty. <laughs> it sounds like, uh, you know, there's the, ethics and then there's the politics of the situation right that kind of rolls into oh yeah you know so uh okay so great so um so rolling right through so let's go on to this next uh segment and this next segment is called workplace stories this is generally can be something lighthearted, can be something relevant um but uh, chris go ahead and read us to uh, this this week's uh, uh workplace story So in a prestigious marketing agency, Sarah, a talented graphic designer, found herself caught in a web of suspicion. 
The company had implemented an employee surveillance system to monitor productivity and protect intellectual property. One day, Sarah's manager approached her, expressing concerns about some confidential client information that had been leaked, despite her innocence. Sarah's personal emails and social media accounts were reviewed as part of the investigation. To everyone's surprise, it was discovered that Sarah had been framed by a disgruntled colleague who had manipulated evidence to tarnish her reputation. The organization took immediate action, clearing Sarah's name, and the true perpetrator was held accountable. This incident sparked a revelation, I'm sorry, a reevaluation of the employee surveillance system and led to stricter protocols for ensuring data integrity and fairness. I mean, there's those, the, the ethics, they did the right thing, I guess, huh? Sounds like it worked out for Sarah. Yeah, I was I was totally expecting to hear like what they found was Sarah was was working on three or four different private client things and <laughs> Sarah was helping her husband with his branding for his company. Now, now where that could go sideways is if while they're doing investigations of you know her purse or private accounts, all of a sudden they find something that's totally unrelated and you know maybe fire fire Sarah for that, right? Like, like that would be where you kind of have gone now too far where you just are um, kind of picking and choosing at what what you're you're pulling from that from that, yeah. that sort of an, an evaluation or an investigation. Um, like that that would be concerning, but it sounds like at least what the way that was described would be how I hope a company would would tackle something. Mm -hmm. um, I think too though there is, you know, there's another part that's concerning is it's you, you can't take the human out of the human, right? Especially when you start going through people's emails and stuff like that. And even if it's, um, you know, even if it's not something that would be potentially unethical for the company, but something about that person's personality, something personal that you now know about that, like, I, how do you then, uh, you know, do you, are you now treating that person different or, or now this person knows that you saw this certain things about them? How does that dynamic work out within the, so there's just a lot wrong with that in general, right? Because a lot of times you'll be, we, we focus on the, well, what were they doing wrong? You know, or, you know, I, you know, I wouldn't have had to look if, you know, if there was nothing to look for, what are you willing to have? But wait, what about just simple you know, your opinions, good politics, right? What if, uh, I mean, we just got out of pandemic, right? <laughs> what if they were railing about vaccines or whatever the case inside of it, right? And then all of a sudden you find out about it and do you start treating the person different? How do you hold back? Mm. So there's a lot that there's an issue with all of that, you know? Well, and, and the, the story has a happy ending. What if, what if at the end of the story it was like, oh, sorry, Sarah, we, Sorry that we messed with you because somebody set you up, right? They didn't change anything. They didn't look at anything. It was just like, oh, sorry. Or or they just stop investigating, right? That's that's my favorite. Like and and <laughs> most HR people will do this and they'll they'll even say that they're guilty of it, but you know, just shh. So here's here's an industry secret. Um when things aren't going when they have to react to something like, oh, you were investigated, you're 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 good now. It, no one will tell her. It'll just it'll just go away. It'll just be swept under the rug. And that's that. And for six months, she'll be like, what's going on? Nobody's asking me any questions. Am I going to get fired? What's you know, right? Like it, it's like if you're you're going for a job and the job got pulled. Right. HR just stops. Recruiters just stop contacting you. Well, I would say and just in my HR and recruiting background, I'd say shitty recruiters do that, right. right? And shitty HR people do that. I think when you're looking to create a process to really engage someone, whether they lose or whether they win, there should be some sort of follow-up and some sort of communication and just full transparency. And I think we are like trying to get to the numbers, the numbers, the numbers, and we forget like, oh, I'm impacting someone's life. Like if I say no, that could be an impact. And if I say yes, it's an impact. So how do we make sure the impact is, it still creates a connection, I right. think is the important thing, you know? Well, and yeah, and if you're in an HR role, uh, 
again, what's what's your ethics? What's your um, your mindset about being in this role? If it is to help people, then you should be you, you should be wanting to have those situations, whether it's positive or negative, right? Whether it's like, oh, this is a person who was found to have done something. Okay, great. Now I'm protecting the company. Maybe I can help this person on the way out, right? Or now, okay, we were able to clear your name, right? Why won't they say something? Why won't they say, what, what was the gal's name? Sarah? Yeah. Why, yeah. why can't you say not incentivized Sarah? To, you're not incentivized to find bad. We're not necessarily incentivized to find all the good. But if I'm an HR leader and I say, sorry, Sarah, we for putting you through this situation, oh, you've now opened the door to a lawsuit. Because now, now the company is admitting fault. So what do they do? Just say nothing. Because yeah. you're better off to say nothing. That is, that's horrible engagement. That's horrible engagement. Because, again, here's a person who just has no information, so doesn't know what's going on. Yeah. And, and in, with mental health, like that's a thing. What happens if this person can't deal with the stress of this situation? And for one reason or another, maybe it becomes hospitalized or, or worse. Right, like the, we we need to figure this out. Yeah, it's got to be some policy changes for sure. Yeah, Jeff. Um, no, I agree. I think what the, what you were just discussing there. I think the uh, the other potential answer of some of those is you know there's that's where technology can be used for good, where there uh, you know data loss prevention tools that you can actually like plug into the applications that you use that house sensitive information to actually know when someone may be like extracting large amounts of, of data, um, which hopefully then ha can have you be a little more proactive about some of that sort of uh, analysis and, and not get into a situation where you're, you know, after the fact trying to figure out um, who, who may have done what, what do they do with this information? How did it get, how may have it gotten leaked? And now you're, you know, uh, having to dive into someone's personal information more than, than you should, so. Yeah, well, I mean, I just imagine, right, um, Pepsi just did a bit or a big rebranding for uh, what used to be Aunt Jemima, right? And I know at least one one person on that team. If you know, she's sending out a, a graphic to the to a printer to to check something, right? Um, can somebody take that email and then manipulate that that email that forwarded email and make it look like she sent it to someone else? Super easy, super easy, and and maybe not even doesn't even leave the organization, but it looks like it did, right? Oh, she needs to be fired. She sent that off to some some reporter, right? Yeah, and it never even left, right? If nobody goes back to check to see, you know, outbound through the mail server, like, no, that that person never sent that to ABC, right? Like, it's that it never went out. Right, they just you'd look at it and be like, "Oh, well, you're fired because you, you breached our security." Yeah, I mean, that, and that's where you know companies need to have the right security tools in place where you can track that back and have have like a if there is some sort of data breach, you can do a proper like root cause analysis, understand where it actually took place um, for for good or for bad, right? To make sure it doesn't happen again, but also to you know hold someone accountable if there is someone to hold accountable. But hopefully, to you know. Uh, exonerate someone if they've been wrongfully accused of, of doing something like that. Nice. All right. So look, we're ending, we're getting to the end of the pro uh, podcast. First of all, thank you so much, Jeff, for, uh, for uh, joining us today. Like you've been, I think um, a lot of insight, a lot of perspective, uh, but last words, Chris, um, you know, before we go, so, you know, so <laughs> employee surveillance for your last words. <laughs> Man, there's such a fine line between um, motivating someone uh, with positive reinforcement and negative reinforcement. And I think it's the same line when uh, surveilling someone. It's like, well, if you're motivating them to do their job, right, then there'll be incentive points around that. If you got to watch them, to see if they're doing their job and then take things away from them when they don't do that. It's just like how you train a kid, like you train them with positive reinforcement. It shows that it, it, it makes them more productive. So that would be my final words is like, let's think as we, as we look to transition back into in-person and 
motivate people. Like, let's get people to do their jobs by not watching them and being on their backs and micromanaging them, but giving them opportunities to have small wins throughout the week, throughout the year, throughout the month. Um, and, and yeah, that should be your focus and that will inspire people. Yeah, I, I would say, I always like to go back to giving power to the people, right? So asking people, what would be helpful for you to have? What data would be helpful for you to have to make your job easier? So that it isn't about like relying on benevolent dictators to, to use the information in the proper way, but to give the employees the chance to say, wow, you know, it would be really helpful for me to plan my month, my week, my, my own goals that I want to achieve to have access to this data. Can you provide that to me? And, and just really do a shift so that the, there, it shows what people talk about a lot, which is trust in the employees. I'd like to see that be the next generation. You know what I love most about you, Michelle? You just said benevolent dictator. Like, <laughs> you're like an oxymoron. <laughs> hmm. uh, uh, Joe, last words? Uh, you know, again, and, and I, I think I've had this last word before in another podcast episode. It's, you know, how are you using these things to inspire, right? What... There are good things. There's necessary things that we need for security, right? And so surveillance is necessary to keep certain things secure. Um, it could be, you know, there are certain things that you can survey, right? Surveillance is a part of surveying um, that could be productive, but it's all about your heart. It's all about your motives, and it's all about, you know, the ability to inspire others to do more, right? Instead of forcing them to to be more in a in a box and, and closing them up and off and, and making them not feel like their best self, feeling limited in other things. Jeff, that's what I guess, last words. I will, uh, I, I guess I'll say in, in general, I feel like, you know, life is lived in the gray where, where in a lot of cases, you know, technology and, and the way people can apply adapt technology and data, it can just be like a black or white situation. And that's not really, that's not the reality of how things work. Um, so I think you need to have that ability to have context. So, you know, if someone does miss some productivity measure, whatever it might be, there's likely a, a good reason for it. And, you know, no big deal. Let's keep moving forward. You know, it really does come down to, I think it was, was already mentioned here, but, you know, just having, having, um, like leadership of teams that, that, that prov provides a positive um, platform for them to actually succeed, right? So you need, you need to use those productivity measures to show what, uh, that you're succeeding, not to show why someone is failing, right? So that, that's a whole different mindset of how you, how you should, they, those should be used. Um, and because in some cases they're actually, um, they're really positive reinforcement to the people that are doing the work. Sometimes people don't feel like they just are just working, working, working. Mm -hmm. Nothing's getting done. But if you say, hey, look, look how much you got done there. Here's how much progress we actually made. Now people start feeling actually a little more motivated to keep keep moving forward. So there's a way to use them you know, positively and not have it feel like it's it's just out there as a stick to hit them with at some point if they if they miss a step somewhere along yeah. the way. So I think that's where it really needs to, the focus needs to be there. Um, and from the conversation you know, Chris and I had, I think it was before we began, around leveraging things like agile, having that kind of a mindset of, of a learning mindset where, you know, you celebrate the wins, you celebrate some of the, the failures because those failures, if they're made in an attempt to push you forward and innovate, whatever that means for a team that you're working with, then that's a success because you've learned something and now, you know, you're better informed for the next thing that you decide to do. So I think that that's where it really needs to be. Um, you know, when, when it crosses the line and actually becomes surveillance is, is when it's, uh, it's, it's a it's a step too far in my opinion mm -hmm. yeah like that yeah that punishment awesome that's amazing yeah i think what i love uh about something you said uh earlier earlier jeff was that um you take the opportunity to educate folks who may not be taking security as serious right which so it all rolls back kind of down to that privacy aspect right where people actually need to learn a little bit more right um instead of signing up for every jeep and mercedes for every contest without reading right <laughs> right so i would say that's that's amazing thank you so much for all your insight and your perspective um as we've started to navigate this workplace theater uh it has been interesting thus far uh, Joe, Michelle, Chris, thank you. And uh, thank you all for watching the 
Workplace Theater Podcast. Thanks, Chef. Thank you. Thanks. Appreciate you having me on. <laughs>If today's discussion resonated with you, don't miss out. Hit the subscribe button now, leave a review, and rate Workplace Theater. Your support helps us improve. Do you have questions or comments? Click the link in our show notes. We'd love to hear from you. Thanks for tuning in to the Workplace Theater. We hope you've enjoyed our podcast. If you're interested in new ways to inspire your team, need help with a sticky workplace situation, or you'd like a communication and engagement strategy for an upcoming important objective, please contact us by emailing workplacetheater at gmail.com. This has been a Working Better Together experience, a division of Exponential Consulting, LLC, 